Asus just made what might be the perfect compact Android phone. This is the Zenfone 10, and it's basically the Pixelate Mini that Google won't make. Along with its compact size, it comes with a spec sheet that reads like an Android nerd's wishlist. The latest Snapdragon 144Hz screen, more RAM and storage than you'll ever need, a genuine 3.5mm headphone jack, and finally, wireless charging. So if you're among the small but perfectly formed section of the smartphone buying public, who's sick of phones so big you could carve a steak on them, then join me for our review of the Asus Zenfone 10. I'm Alex Toby, this is XDA TV, let's dive in. First of all, if this phone looks familiar, it's because, well, Asus hasn't reinvented the wheel here, coming from the previous Zenfone 9. The phone still fits in the same 5.9-inch footprint, and the combination of metal and matte plastic construction remains. The aluminium outer frame is identical, and the back panel is almost the same, only slightly thicker to accommodate some extra hardware that we'll get to later. I'm sort of split on this device's design. It cribs from Asus's laptop design language, but I don't know how well this aesthetic translates over to a phone. It's a bit sci-fi and almost try-hard compared to some of the competition. The irregular and fairly thick display borders of last year's Zenfone are still around. The top border is slightly different to the bottom chin area, which in turn is different from the left and right borders. To me, this just looks a little sloppy compared to the near-perfect symmetry of rivals like Samsung S23. The panel itself is at least constructed of Gorilla Glass Victus, so it should be pretty well protected from knocks and scrapes. Around the back, Asus has a unique matte plastic texture that's almost reminiscent of paper mache. It's really a difficult texture to describe, sort of halfway between your traditional soft touch plastic and OnePlus's more coarse sandstone texture. Incidentally, if this sounds like something that very much does not float your boat, then the white colour option has a slightly smoother texture. I'm not in love with this design or this texture, but what I can't deny is how it helps with grip. If you're prone to fumbling slipperier phones, then between the size and the finish, you'll definitely have a better time with the Zenfone. As compact as this is in terms of vertical and horizontal dimensions, it is a fairly chunky handset on account of just how much extra high-tech magic is lurking within. So let's hop back to that spec sheet and fill the rest of it out. We've already touched on the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, up to 16 gigabytes of RAM and a half terabyte of storage, plus the same 4300 milliamp hour battery capacity that gave last year's Zenfone such legendary endurance. Other essentials like IP68 water resistance are back too, along with side-mounted fingerprint scanner, which works works flawlessly in my testing. And yeah, there is indeed a 3.5mm headphone jack to be found up top here, just like the Zenfone 9. People keep using it, Asus says, so they keep including it. It's not a big deal to me personally, I pretty much exclusively use wireless earbuds these days, but if you want it, it's there and it works great. The other temple hardware feature of the previous Zenfone also makes a comeback, the gimbal-stabilized main camera, which, despite some design changes to the outer frame of the lenses, has the same internal hardware as last year. We'll get to how that actually performs a little later on, so stick around. All of that's joined this time around by Qi wireless charging, which I think I'm going to take personal credit for given how much I've complained to my Asus contacts about the lack of this feature in previous Zenfones. It's a great added convenience to have that's long been missing from Asus's phones, though the phone's shorter stature means that some wireless chargers don't work quite right with it. I have a couple of older OnePlus docks that were particularly problematic. Both wireless charging at up to 15 watts and wired charging at 30 are done over the usual standard, so no weird proprietary chargers required. And that said, good guy Asus is still including a charging brick in the box as an additional kindness. If you're familiar with the Zenfone 9, or you've just seen any of our other Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 phone reviews, you're probably expecting to see great battery life from the Zenfone 10, and you'd be absolutely right. Asus says the new chip should give a 13% increase in efficiency compared to the Zenfone 9's Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, but honestly, that phone was also so great battery-wise that the difference is tough for me to see. Either way, with my regular use, I was looking at 7 hours of screen on time being doable over a heavy day's use, or 2 days easily with more moderate use. And that kind of truly excellent longevity is even better when you can augment it with reasonably quick wireless top-ups throughout the day. So the picture coming into focus here is of an iterative update to last year's Zenfone. That's not a bad thing though, it was our pick for best compact phone of the year after all. And while I'm a little lukewarm on the design, you can't fault the power on offer here, whether it's the battery life or just the sheer number crunching power. 
The Snapdragon Eight Gen 2 brings unbeatable performance and efficiency in a phone of this size. And Asus has upped its refresh rate to 144Hz this year, though this faster refresh mode is only available in selected games. In other apps, your maximum option is 120Hz, though the phone ships by default in dynamic refresh mode that caps you at 90 most of the time. I'm perfectly fine with 90Hz, anything above this is largely gravy anyway, most people have a hard time telling the difference with anything above 90. The Zenfone 10 retains the same 1100 nits of peak brightness as its predecessor, making for easy outdoor use even in direct sunlight. There are brighter phone screens out here from Samsung and others, but still you won't need to strain your eyes here. Aside from that headphone jack, the Zenfone's audio performance is also competent, from a bottom firing speaker backed up by the earpiece tweeter up top. It doesn't pack the sheer volume that you get from some larger handsets, but Asus' setup managed to produce a balanced, pleasing soundscape without scratchy treble or over-the-top bass. And actually, the plastic back panel seems to help out a little here, acting as a sort of inbuilt acoustic chamber. Asus' Zen UI combines a stock Android aesthetic with a huge amount of extra customizability and software features that have been refined over the past three or four years. When you first power on, you'll be asked if you want a stock Android look or Asus's tweaked UI. In reality, these are both pretty similar design-wise and quite close to stock Android, though Asus's UI tweaks could be helpful if you prefer to have more options at your fingertips. Either way, compared to something like Samsung's What UI, it's a lot closer to Google's vision of Android, with a clock style and interface elements that'll be familiar to anyone who's owned or played with a Pixel. It's a clean, fast UI that's a joy to use, and in fact, the only thing about this experience that feels perhaps a little bit cheap is its haptic feedback. This might seem like I'm being incredibly nitpicky, but the vibration feedback of the Zenfone is a couple of years out of step with the competition, with taps and buzzers that feel a little soft and mushy compared to the S23 or pretty much any Google Pixel or iPhone. Like the irregular screen borders, it's just something that makes the experience feel a bit less polished. Besides that, Asus's experience is exemplary. It really does show you how you can add your own software features and even a handful of first-party apps without upsetting the look and feel of Android. Favorite tricks of mine include the swipe gesture on the fingerprint scanner, which lets you scroll in some apps or drag down the notification shade. And this key is also programmable for a long press or double tap. There's a twin app feature, as we've seen from many other brands, great if you want to juggle multiple accounts in WhatsApp or Facebook. And the Edge Shortcut tool takes some inspiration from Samsung with a customizable tab of shortcuts. Only thing you're really missing is a windowed app mode, but on a screen of this size, that wouldn't be super practical anyway. Another slight downer is that right now, Asus is only committing to two generations of Android OS updates, which puts it clearly behind the likes of Samsung and even OnePlus with their four-year promises. You'll get security updates for longer, of course, but this is one area where the extra resources of a Samsung or a Google really shows. Either way, the core tenets of Zen UI continue in the same vein as previous Zenfones. A stock look and feel combined with features and tweaks that are great if you want to take advantage of them, but otherwise easy to ignore or turn off. On paper, the rear cameras of this Zenfone haven't changed at all, despite its slightly updated lens design. Your primary is still a 50 megapixel Sony IMX766 behind an f1.85 lens, paired with a hardware gimbal system that goes above and beyond the typical smartphone OIS. The sensor isn't the newest, but the IMX766 is a tried and true part that's a good fit for a phone at this price. And that gimbal is as impressive as it's ever been in video mode. To give you an idea of just how much motion it can absorb, it, you can enable a visual overlay that shows you the motion of the lens here. And even in some fairly challenging situations in mixed lighting, Asus's gimbal does a fantastic job at 4K with 30 frames per second, even in HDR mode. The bumps and judders that often work their way into footage due to walking motion or other harsh movements are easily massaged out by this gimbal camera. And if you need even more stabilization, then Hyper Steady Mode brings a more aggressive software algorithm into play, trading resolution for software stability. While the hardware may not have changed too much on paper, Asus's processing has been upgraded considerably with the aim of pulling out more fine detail even in challenging conditions. Asus calls this hyper clarity. Basically, it's using more raw camera data for a clearer, sharper image. A side-by-side -side comparison with the Zenfone 9 is the best way to show this off, but equally you can see here how next to Samsung's Galaxy S23, the Zenfone really does hold its own. That's all the more impressive considering the Galaxy has a dedicated 3x lens, whereas Asus is just using a digital zoom. 
Overall image quality from this camera is competent with ample dynamic range and colors that appear broadly true to life without excessive saturation or contrast. Like the Zenfone 9, I notice a tendency towards slightly over-sharpening images in certain situations, particularly in areas of high contrast or lots of fine detail like the brickwork here. Otherwise, this is a very capable main camera and I wouldn't worry at all about the slightly older sensor being used here. It still performs great even in lower light. The ultrawide is a bit more pedestrian in its performance. It's not bad and colors are broadly in line with what you get out of that main camera with similar characteristics around slightly over sharpening in some areas, but it also doesn't particularly stand out from the crowd. The front facing camera on the other hand has been upgraded with a new RGBW sensor with additional white pixels as well as the standard red, green and blue. This combined with a higher 32 megapixel resolution helps to capture more detail in challenging lighting conditions. Though unfortunately you do lose the Zenfone 9's autofocus capabilities in the process and video output from that front facer is still sadly capped at 1080p. So yeah, on the face of it, not a huge upgrade from the Zenfone's camera, but I feel Asus has done just about enough of this generation to stay competitive at its chosen price point. Whether this is the best small phone overall is a tough question. What I can say though is it's the best small phone for me personally with my priorities. One I want a device that's compact, covers all the major bases in terms of display, audio and camera, while also boasting top tier performance and amazing battery life. And this year I get all of that in a phone that also does wireless charging. For me, that's a huge addition. The obvious rival is Samsung's Galaxy S23, though it's a device with very different priorities, slightly weaker battery life and much more opinionated software. Nevertheless, Samsung does give you longer software support, a triple camera system that's slightly better in some situations, and exclusive features like the DeX desktop replacement mode. Still, for me personally, I would choose the Zenfone over this or any other compact Android phone. Although I think the design needs an overhaul, and I hope to see that with the Zenfone 11 next year, the balance of features, technologies, and compromises here makes perfect sense for me. And if this sounds like what you want out of a compact Android phone too, then I can't recommend it enough. Google won't make a Pixel 8 mini to match the Zenfone 10, but when this phone exists and is as good as it is, maybe that doesn't matter. That's it for now, let me know what you think of the Zenfone 10 down in the comments, and be sure to subscribe for more reviews like this one, we really appreciate it. In the meantime, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.